Hi friends, I'm Michael Kingswood. This is story time. It is Saturday, so we are doing Story Saturday today, reading one of the stories that I wrote, so you can enjoy it and then come back for more. But first, we're going to have a word from our sponsor. Our sponsor being me. In the world of valor and magic, two soldiers flee from their past. An isolated mountain town suffers under the heel of a vicious band of brigands. An offer of redemption for the one, salvation for the other, but not without great risk to both. Action and adventure await in Glimmer Vale, the first book of the Glimmer Vale Chronicles. Get your copy today, wherever great books are sold. All right, it is Saturday, Story Saturday, and we are getting cooking. We are going into the first story from the Volume 2 of last year's 52 Stories in 2023 project, and this story is called The Walker's Package. It features my favorite character, Dustin Cofield, Elf Exterminator. Those of you guys who know me and know my work and my writing know how cool Dustin is and you enjoy his stories as much as I do, I hope. And those of you who haven't met me yet and haven't met Dustin yet, you're in for a treat because his stories are always fun. I know what you're thinking. Go, hang on, Kingswood. What the heck's an elf exterminator? Well, stay tuned. You're about to find out. I'm going to read it because it's awesome when I read it because I wrote it. It's awesome when the writer reads his own stuff and uh, you're going to enjoy it. That's an order. Here we go. I'll talk to you on the other end. When you spend all your time fixated on the mission to preserve Christmas from the monkey wrenches that mutinous elves keep trying to throw at it and to keep the normal world from knowing about the battle being fought beneath their noses, it's easy to forget that normal life still goes on. But sometimes even the deepest of deep cover special agents gets a call from the real world. And when that call comes... It's very hard not to answer. I'm Dustin Cofield, and I'm an elf exterminator. For once, I didn't have any paperwork to do, and there wasn't any case screaming at me to solve it. I'd even gotten through my quarterly audit with accounting last week, on time for once, and without a hitch. So as I stepped into my little 8x8 office in the rear of a Wells Fargo branch that I'd used as cover for the last several years and settled down into the comfortable hardness of my desk chair, I found myself at a loss for what to do. Very unusual, especially for a Monday. It had been a good weekend. I'd taken Nora and my girlfriend camping in a state park an hour east of Lockwood, the suburban cliché of a town where I'd been stationed for as long as I'd been in the spank and we'd spent an enjoyable and relaxing time hiking, living simply, and just enjoying each other and nature. It was a shame to have to come back, but I was excited to get back about my work, defending the world from the elfin menace, and ensuring that the big guy's operation up at the pole continued without a hitch was an exhilarating and important calling. Most of the time. I soaked in the ambiance of my little office for a few moments. The lingering smell of ink and carbon paper was somehow still in the air despite my finishing up typing my last report on the 1930s-era typewriter atop my desk three days ago. A narrow sliver of morning sunlight streaming in from the one window in the wall across from me gave light to the little potted flowering plants I couldn't tell you the variety that Nora gave to me a while back. And off to the left was a cork board on the wall next to my office door, covered with mimeographed memos and notices from higher. I looked at it and frowned. The photo of the big guy himself next to the corkboard from an award ceremony up at the pole a few years back seemed to stare at me. His big jolly smile, that never seemed completely genuine to me, seemed twisted with chagrin as though he was about to cajole me for forgetting something or for not doing something. Just then, the old-style rotary phone sitting on the right-hand side of my stout, oak-carved desk next to my calendar blotter rang. The metallic tinkling of the phone's bell almost sounded like jingle bells for a second, almost, and it made me start in my chair. I smirked at the big guy's picture and my own silliness and picked up the receiver. Cofield. Hey, Dustin. It was Colleen, the evidence tech at the agency's local lab. 
halfway around the beltway of the metropolitan area that Lockwood inhabited from my bank office. Are you busy today? I couldn't help but chuckle. Not even a little bit. Good, because I need your help. I'll be right over. A quaver came into her voice, and the hackles on the back of my neck rose. I could practically hear the emphatic head shake in her voice as she replied, Not the lab. Come by my place? I blinked. I knew where Colleen lived. I'd been there a couple times for social reasons. She had thrown a couple barbecues and her parents had arranged a surprise party for her 25th birthday that I had helped with. But it had been a while. We were colleagues, but not exactly close friends. Everything okay? She paused for a couple seconds, then that tremor grew a bit in her voice. I'm not sure. How soon can you get here? I looked over at the wall across from the door in the corkboard, where an old-fashioned counterweight-powered clock hung. It was five minutes to ten. Rush hour traffic would be mostly dying down by now. Fifteen or twenty minutes? Good. Hurry. I had the receiver back in his cradle and was out the door in a flash. Colleen was waiting for me outside her place when I pulled up eighteen minutes later. She had a townhouse in a nice little subdivision two exits away from the agency's lab where she worked. Not the corner house, unfortunately, but the next one in but directly across the street from the neighborhood's clubhouse, which has the swimming pool, gym, and tennis courts. Good on them for the tennis courts. Most places didn't have those unless they were single-family structures. Then again, there were HOA dues to consider. Colleen had complained about them to me several times, and it made me feel glad that I had bought a small place in an out-of-the-way, older, but non-HOA neighborhood. I'm not sure if I could have kept my cool dealing with some of the things she had to go through just to live there. But as I parked my souped-up Yukon into the guest spot adjacent to her place, I could tell from her expression that the HOA woes were the least of Colleen's concerns this Monday. At the office, she normally wore a lab coat over her civilian clothing. Not that she had a PhD or anything, she just liked shows like CSI and NCIS and thought the coat fit her role well. Nothing wrong with that either, and she more than put the look to justice. She had single-handedly cracked more cases than I could name offhand with her forensic skills. But today she just had on blue yoga pants and an off-white athletic shirt that was made of material that would wick sweat away from her to prevent chafing. The outlines of the black sports bra she wore beneath were clearly visible, showing that the sweat from her morning workout was still drying up. Colleen was pretty enough, but a little bit overweight and not my type despite her intellect and engaging wit. She was a blonde, and even if I was dumb enough to consider dating someone I worked with, I preferred brunettes and ravens didn't stop me from enjoying working with her and appreciating her professionalism and competence. But when I stepped out of my truck and walked over to her, her professional demeanor was only slightly able to keep the emotional turmoil beneath from registering on her face. Thanks for coming so quickly, she said, and gestured for me to follow as she walked toward the door to her place. Happy to help, I said, and moved quickly to catch up with her. What's the problem? She stopped at her front door, which was painted light blue a jarring tone compared with the beige-gray stucco of the rest of her building, then turned to the right and gestured toward a little alcove adjacent to her door. Some people would place a bench there, or a potted plant. Colleen had elected to place a scale model of an Imperial ATSD scout walker in its place. The six-foot-tall, two-legged armored assault mech had its fake, but somehow still a little bit intimidating, chin cannons pointed directly at the area in front of the door where a solicitor would come knocking. She didn't have a no soliciting sign hanging anywhere. I never thought she needed one, before. Now there was a package wrapped in Christmas-style wrapping paper between the ATST's legs, with a sealed pink envelope on top. As I looked at the package and the envelope, the incongruity between their color scheme, the gray combat tone of the ATST, and the paint of Colleen's house struck me such that I had to stop myself from engaging in contemplations about the multiple strains of input that impinge on our everyday understanding of reality, and how could a person come to terms with them while still remaining sane and... I shook my head, forcefully, and gritted my teeth while imagining brutal revenge on my sophomore year philosophy professor. That brought me back to the present nicely. Someone left you a present, I said, working hard to keep the why the hell are you even bothering me with this tone from my voice. Not just someone, she said, and stepped over to the package. She lifted up the envelope and turned back to me, holding it out toward my face. Almost immediately, the smell of peppermint reached my nostrils, and the hackles in the back of my neck rose to full attention that put their earlier alert to shame. Pointies, I said. Colleen nodded. But it didn't really have to be pointies. 
As I drove to the forensics lab, Colleen in the passenger seat and the stuff from her front porch tucked away in the back of my Yukon, I pondered the multitude of other possibilities. I looked sidelong at her. You sure it wasn't Scott? Scott was Colleen's boyfriend of two years. He was an engineer at a civil engineering support firm that handled a bunch of city contracts, repairing roads, things like that. And last I saw him, he looked to dig Colleen a lot, so maybe he had... I broke up with him a month ago, she said, putting an abrupt stop to that train of thought. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Was it... I let the question draw out, curious, but not wanting to pry too hard. She shrugged. We just wanted different things. Ah, I let the subject drop. And there's been no one else? I asked after a minute of veering through traffic that was moving far too slow for the gap between rush hours. Colleen snorted and shook her head. I halfway expected she might be embarrassed or offended for suggesting she had hooked up with someone else so soon after leaving her boyfriend, but if anything, she looked amused. There's always another man, Dustin, she said, and tossed her head slightly. But no, no one's serious. Who knows where I live? Unadded. No chance at Scott trying to get you back? Colleen frowned, then shook her head. No, I heard he met someone else already. Her lips compressed, and I detected a tightness in her voice as she said that. Something told me she wasn't as nonchalant about the breakup as she let on. I decided discretion was the better part of valor and didn't press it. Well, we'll see if it was the pointy soon enough, right? There was equipment at the lab that could tell that definitively. Pointies gave off a signature odor, which smelled completely like peppermint, but which had subtle and identifiable trace chemical compounds. We would know for certain as soon as she was able to put the package and envelope through a formal analysis. Colleen nodded again, but looked a little less certain. She didn't say anything, though. Ten minutes later, we pulled into the strip mall where the agency's local forensics lab was located. They sat in the rear room of a thrift store, which was run by the agency, and served as a fitting and actually profitable front for the lab that Colleen ran. We zipped past the guy who ran the thrift shop front, who nodded gravely in greeting to each of us, though he raised a questioning eyebrow at me, and then we were in Colleen's lab. It wasn't large, but it was well stocked and functional. Metal shelves lined the walls on either side as we walked in, and the rear wall as well, holding down cardboard boxes with standardized labels on their ends that were filled out with case numbers. Evidence from various scams I'd run down over the recent years. Well, me and the other guys stationed around the metropolitan area, anyway. In the center of the room was Colleen's large lab table slash workstation. It had a tower-cased computer with large ergonomic monitor and keyboard on one end, and all manner of imaging and analysis equipment positioned neatly all around the table in all directions, so she could easily move from one piece of gear to another as she had need. The place smelled clean, and no wonder, as Colleen was so meticulous that the agency decided long ago they didn't need to hire a janitorial team for the place. I understand she got accommodation for budgetary innovation the year they realized that. Only government organization I'd ever seen or heard of that liked not spending every penny it got. Probably because the agency wasn't really a government agency, it was more... Colleen switched on her computer, then powered up the gas spectrometer around the corner from it, and came back to me, holding out her hand imperiously as she slipped from her confused and slightly scared state back into forensic analysis who was on top of it mode. I grinned at her and set the still-wrapped package down on a clear space near the end of her analysis table, then picked up the envelope and handed it to her. She accepted it with a nod, then spent the next several minutes cutting off a little section of the envelope's paper, treating with a fluid of some sort, and then stuck it into her machine. A few taps on her keyboard later, and she sat back in the high back stool she had in place at her station for her use. I had to stand and wait. Several minutes later, I lost track of how long, and I didn't check my watch to find out. The analyzer beeped, and a readout appeared on Colleen's computer monitor. She leaned forward pursing her lips as she read the results. Then she blinked and obviously paused to read them again. Her cheeks flushed and she cleared her throat. Then she looked back at me over her shoulder. Her expression was perplexed and a bit embarrassed. It's just peppermint, she said, sounding baffled to go with her expression. Just peppermint. The elves that deserted the pole after a labor dispute with the big guy, like all Christmas elves, had a distinct aroma, easily confused with peppermint, Hell, most of the time if a guy in my line smells peppermint, he assumes it's a pointy on the spot, because better is safe than sorry. But though it smells the same, an elf's scent molecules are very different from regular old peppermint, and Colleen's spectrometer would show the differences easily. So if it didn't, 
I looked back at the envelope sitting back atop the wrapped package where I placed it after Colleen did her business with it. It was pink, unlabeled, and all of a sudden much less threatening. I grabbed it up and tore the envelope open, pulled out the very Christmassy card within, which boasts a very cheerful-looking couple sitting and looking at each other with smiles on their faces in front of a Christmas tree and below a sprig of mistletoe on its front cover. I opened the card I read the neatly flowing script within, then cleared my throat and closed the card, holding it out to Colleen as I tried to keep the embarrassed flush from my cheeks. She cocked her head to the side, confused, then took the card away from me. As she read, her eyebrows rose high onto her forehead, and she did flush. Not just pink. Her cheeks went full crimson. Oh, she said, and her free hand went to her chest above her heart. She sank back against the seat back of her stool and seemed to sag. But not from defeat, it was like the tension was leaving her body, and from the way the corners of her mouth were turning upward, that tension was being replaced by the warm feeling of pleasure that comes from knowing you are desired. Oh my, she added, and she sounded a little breathless. Nora had on a light blue collared shirt that had the top two buttons undone, offering a tantalizing hint about the figure that I knew and enjoyed so much. She had gone without haircuts for a while, so her black hair was no longer pixie cut. It touched her shoulders enticingly, swaying gently as she moved her head around and making it easy for me to not glance at those open buttons every few seconds. Mostly. We were in Applebee's, where we met often for lunch on the days when we both could get away. Since I had nothing else going on and Colleen's issue had resolved itself quite nicely, today was one of those days. Nora's eyes twinkled in the sunlight that was streaming in through the window next to our table as she lifted her coffee cup to her lips to take a sip. So who is this guy, she asked after swallowing. I shrugged. His name's Bob. I guess he and Colleen met a year or so ago at a party she got invited to, and it turns out they live a block away from each other. They've been hanging out every now and then. She just thought of him as a friend, but... I shrugged again and picked up the menu to have a look at it. Though really there was no need, I already knew what I wanted... Hard to go wrong with a nice, juicy burger. But he'd been holding a torch for her the whole time, Nora said, and she pursed her lips as she pondered it. So what, he heard that she and Scott broke up and figured to make a move? Yeah, definitely still the burger. I put the menu back down. I guess you could say that. But give the guy props, he wrote a nice note, and he knew exactly the gift to give her. Leather-bound editions of Newton's Principia and Machiavelli's Discourses on Livy? I shook my head and whistled. I can't think of a more sure way into Colleen's heart than that sort of thing. Nora gave me a look, and I grinned at her. Believe me, I winked. I've tried. She snorted, and we shared a laugh. She knew well how my tastes went, and she had nothing to worry about with Colleen. So is she going to call him, then? It was my turn to snort. Call him? She practically stampeded out of the office to knock his door down. Nora blinked, and I added, In a good way. I paused. I think. She raised her coffee mug again. So all's well that ends well, I suppose. Yep, hopefully. Nora raised another eyebrow and I shrugged again. What was I, a love counselor? I hoped for both their sakes it worked out for them, but it wasn't up to me. After a moment, Nora nodded agreement. I hope so. Colleen's good people and she deserves someone special. Yep. And just then I spied our waitress coming over toward our table. I raised my hand to indicate we were ready to order. That burger was Colin. All right, all's well that ends well for good old Colleen. And uh, all's well that ends with the burger for good old Dustin. Uh, yeah, so not exactly the earth-shaking, earth shaking, you know, saving the world thing, but hey, it's always good when the little... when those kids get together. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I like this one. Hopefully you did too. Uh, But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, Kingswood, where the hell were you last weekend? And, yeah. uh, You know, the previous week I'd spent in uh, Tennessee doing LibertyCon stuff. And I got back and was focusing on hunkering down on novel writing. And I uh, had a couple of weird things come up. And uh, the main one was my dad was coming to visit. And he was supposed to get here on one one day. And so I planned my recording and accommodate that. But he ended up showing up a day early because he was driving across the country. And he's taking a road trip. And so he just sh- showed up a day early. I was like, oh, crap. And that screwed up my whole process. So I didn't get this done in time for 
story Saturday last week. So um, apologies, but you you know you got a good story now anyway. Uh, but hey, maybe you're wondering about LibertyCon. LibertyCon was pretty awesome. Um, it's always fun to visit Tennessee. Anytime you get out of California is a good time. You know what I'm saying? So, but um, you know, I've, I've come to like Chattanooga the couple times I've been there. And I went there with a couple goals. The main one was to meet more people and just more networking. And also I'm getting ready to kickstart uh, my Space Navy book here in a few weeks. And I wanted to give out some free samples for people to entice them, to pull them in like a drug dealer with the first test. First taste is free. Uh, so that people read it and be like, oh, cool, let's go back that campaign. Uh, and I gave out all of the copies I made of that. And I wanted to sell a couple books in the little author's alley. And I managed to do that, too. So everything got accomplished. Made a couple of, made a couple of good dudes who I... Um, we became fast friends with which was great and we're keeping in touch and it's more contacts and just generally left feeling good and upbeat and raring to go with this keeping on with this writing thing and there is a feature out there <laughs> to, for for making this work and making money so that's a good thing uh so it was a good time uh, uh well obviously looking forward to going back there again next year and looking for other i guess cons we can go to closer although you know, there's there's the cash flow thing of how much do you want to spend for this stuff, and also there's, you know, how much time do you want to spend on it, and also there's some some cons are not some not all of them are the same in terms of business networking, I guess. Ah, right, we'll figure it out. Anyway, well that was a good time. Um, moving forward, uh, like I said, we are getting ready to do a Kickstarter at the end of July for my space navy book the warfare qualified it is going to be called and i think i i don't think i showed you guys the little art i made up for it yet uh but you're saying hey what the heck is this warfare qualified thing kingswood well you remember um the story i read back in the first volume uh midwatch midwatch uh Asylum with the Ukrainian Confederation Navy pilots who have the uh, encounter and a little bit of stress during the Midwatch. Well, the, it doesn't feature them, but the, the, the Space Navy novel is going to be featuring good old Ukrainian Confederation Navy guys. Because I definitely wanted to write a good Space Navy book that, uh, to, that was actually, you know looks like it feels like a navy if that makes any sense um because a lot of space navy books i've read over the years kind of don't and you know is what it is but hey we're gonna show you this let's uh this artwork that i made for it let's see if i can find it here i'm pulling it up because i'm doing this all live because why not um Okay, I guess. Oh, here it is. Boom. Let's have to see how this looks. This is um this is a poster I made for the 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 convention to show people off to like them entice. And I turned this thing big old poster set it up on a a, a stand when I set up in author's alley. And I had my little giveaway books there. It went really well. I also turned it into bookmarks that I handed out. And so generally I made a good uh, little showing of it. But as you can see, the uh, Kickstarter set to start on July 30th. And you can already go to uh, follow the Kickstarter page now. Uh, the uh, michaelkingswood.com slash ICN kick will get you over to that. And you can click the little follow button. And that will uh, send notifications when the campaign launches. And it does a couple of different things. A, it makes sure you know about it, so you know when to back it as soon as possible. B, the more people who follow it, the more Kickstarter seems to like it. And when you get lots of people following it, when it launches, you get more, more attention and visibility, supposedly. We'll see. 
So that's why I've got it set up now. But I know what you're thinking. Hey, Kingswood, you did a Kickstarter like two months ago. Where the hell's the book for that? Well, I promised the book would be to people by September, and we're finishing up the, uh, the, the steps for that to happen, and it's on schedule. So good to go. But the thing about these campaigns is they help me to not procrastinate. That's why I do them. <laughs> so that's the plan on that. Um, so moving ahead, we're going to be finishing up getting uh, Glimmer Veil 7 to people and then working on this. And towards the end of the year, we're going to do another campaign um, for another cool thing that uh, I started years ago and then stopped because I got distracted by other things and now I'm going to finally get and finish it um, and that's a long story we'll talk about that later so anyway that's where, that's where we stand now in the writing world I uh, hope you uh, are, <laughs> are now caught up and understand okay so hope the story this week was good I hope you liked it next week we are going to do the next story it's called Karen's Rules of the Pool this is Homeowners Association Horror. And it is what it sounds like. You will you will enjoy it very much. Come back on next Saturday. We will do that. In the meantime, besides uh, going and following the Kickstarter thing that I just told you about, you should go buy some books. MichaelKingswood.com slash store will get you to all the books I have. In whatever format you want. With maximum product with maximum profit to me because you don't go to the middleman go straight to my company credit card processing fees and website fees and that's about it and hey you know more money more money more money you can of course and, and the good thing about it is the way i've got it set up is even if you're using a kindle or somebody else there's a the, the system i use makes it very easy to load if you're doing ebooks onto your device quite simply if you're getting print books or audiobooks, I mean, that's that's easy in and of itself. So don't worry about that. We can handle the technical side. Uh, but if you still like going through all the middlemen, the uh, various retailers out there, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Play, iBooks, you name it. Uh, there's a million of them out there. My books are everywhere. Go to mikekingswood.com slash books to read. That's the number two. And you can pick the store that you like and go there. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit the little notification thingies, tell all your buddies, and if you want to, you know, support the podcasting efforts around here, go to Subscribestar, subscribestar.com slash Michael Nash Kingswood, you can throw a couple bucks our way to keep the lights on, and you can get some extra st short stories or whatever, um, and help the brother out. Not much going on over there, because, you know, it's still relatively unknown, and it's still relatively new, but we'd like to have stuff going on on there, so go check it out. Might be fun. And regardless of what you do, make sure you come back next week for the next story. And until we do that, until I see you then, don't do anything I wouldn't do.